What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Rams Brothers. I'm your host, Dean, and I'm joined by my brother and the other hosts of this show, Nick. And Nick, Super Bowl weekend is not for another week. A lot of moving pieces with the coaching searches. We're going to talk about the offensive line in this episode. But first and most importantly, how are you, my brother? I got 10, 10K on NFC in the Pro Bowl. <laughs> Who's All the coach money's... of the NFC team? Is it Eli Manning and Pete Eli Davidson? Manning. And, and, assist, gonna... and assistant coach Pete Davidson. Yeah, you're going to give me a chance to bet on Eli Manning again. <laughs> I'm going to have to take it. Over his older brother, Peyton. I don't know about all that. But um, yeah, those festivities kick off on Sunday. I think tonight is actually the long drive dodgeball. I saw Jalen Ramsey gearing up for a potential dodgeball event. You were asking me before the episode started if Jared Goff had been warming up the old gun. I'm actually not sure. Okay, I'm not crazy about Pro Bowl festivities. Definitely fascinated in the fact that they're doing a long drive. I'm going to see how far Josh Allen could hit a golf ball. I think that's going to be fun to watch. But outside of that, Nick, we talked about in previous episodes, moving pieces with the coaching staff. Obviously still a vacancy at special teams coordinator, still a vacancy potentially a defensive coordinator if Raheem Morris does get poached to become the head coach of the Indi Indianapolis Colts. Um, I think the biggest thing with the whole coaching search, we're only going to spend a couple of minutes on this. As news broke today that Thomas Brown is actually getting a look for the Cowboys as the potential next offense coordinator after they let a perfectly capable candidate in Kellen Moore just <laughs> walk right out of the door. So um, strange. So, so strange. strange. And and Raheem Morris is on his 17th interview with Jim Mersey. What are they touring the city of Indianapolis, going to the museum? I can't imagine what the hell they're doing in all that time. And they're also interviewing another potential 17 candidates. Technically, it's seven. But Jeff's, I mean, is Jeff Saturday going to get the job? Shane Steichen, Wayne Martindale, Ajiro Vero, Raheem Morris, like they have all had second interviews and it's seven candidates now with second interviews, right? So I think my gut tells me at this point, just in evaluating everything that Raheem Morris is going to stay, right? If he's a clear cut potential candidate to run the Indianapolis Colts out of seven other potential candidates on top of the interim head coach who Jim Irsay is obsessed with, I would be surprised. But my gut's telling me is that Raheem Morris potentially going to stay. And then with that, you have Thomas Brown, Eric Henderson, Zach Robinson, Eric Yarber, Chris Shula. If they all stay put and you add Matt LaFleur or Mike LaFleur on top, you know, I feel like you have a legitimate offseason if you can add a legitimate offensive line coach who has NFL experience and a special teams coordinator to complete the puzzle. Um, yeah. So a lot, of, yeah. a lot of stuff there. I feel the same way about Raheem coming back. Uh, I think the defense was certainly problematic last year, you know, so it's interesting that we're kind of in this like gray area where some of the fans want him to come back. Most really don't want him to come back. It seems at least the vocal ones don't seem to seem to want him back. I don't think he's going to get the head coaching job. So I'm, I'm just expecting that. But in a situation when the offense wasn't putting up a lot of points, the defense looked like it struggled, but then, you know, flash to Raheem's first year as the offense or uh, defensive coordinator with the Rams when the, you know, when everything was firing, he was good enough and he was good in big moments. So I will, I will accept him back with open arms. I'm looking forward to it. And I think, you know, with the baby LaFleur, you're going to have a lot more different looks on offense. So it's, you're going to be able to accept a little, and like, hypothetically, the defense isn't going to be on the field as much as they were last year because there was so much stalling on offense, exactly. which causes a lot of deep, like the, the defense to look like they're fumbling. So, yeah, I mean, you go into 2021, obviously, they had a great year holistically as a defense. 2020, great year with Brandon Stanley. Then moving into last year, I feel like they really kind of hit their stride towards the back end of the season. You saw them kind of come together in the last four or five games, similarly to the, the way the Rams offense did. So you could tell it's complimentary football playing both sides. It obviously benefits the whole team. So I think it's interesting to see what's going to happen at, at defense coordinator. But Raheem Morris, I think our take for right now is the fact that he's potentially going to stay as the Rams' defense coordinator, which you could chalk up as a massive win for the Rams. You don't have to you know, outsource. You don't have to go outside of the box and find another potential candidate. So I think that's a good sign. But I think for in terms of major priorities for the offseason, I think it's this is something that we've neglected so far in our offseason conversations, and it's rebuilding the offensive line. And I think the reason why we neglected it is because it's such a, a load to take on. Right. It's, it's such an undertaking as to where a lot of pieces could potentially be replaced. You don't know how much continuity you're going to have from year to year. And I'll start right off at the left tackle position. 
Joe Noteboom. Nick, is he even a, a, a competent, capable left tackle in this league at this point? He's a $15.5 million cap hit this season coming up. Um, and obviously the Rams signed him to a long-term extension. I, I like. I don't know if that's going to be your guy moving forward who's going to be able to protect your potential blind side of your quarterback. I don't know if he's shown enough throughout the years to be able to you know, come back from rehab and, and, and be able to own that position outright all over again. But I don't know. Did you like what you saw from him in this past season? No. I mean, I wasn't a fan. But given the circumstances, you know, and the, you know, twister of offensive linemen that we had, I don't really think it's a fair assessment. I think you have to go back further, truly. And, and it's not like his resume is like horrendous. No, it's not. No, it's, it's, I mean, they f- felt like he was a capable left tackle behind Andrew Whitworth. They got his sign off, right? If they bring him back into the building, is that potentially reinstalling and reinstilling confidence back into Joe Noteboom? So maybe there's a win win there where you could tie that back together and you could justify the cap hit for this year or potentially even offer to restructure him. I think there was some rumor about a potential injury clause in his contract to where if he was injured last year, they could potentially get out of the contract for this year. If he didn't play a certain amount of games, they could potentially get out of the contract. So I think it's going to be interesting to monitor. The reason why I bring that up is because obviously the Chiefs are a hot topic, right? And I think that the Super Bowl coming up, you saw a lot of moving pieces with their offensive line over the past three years. So I kind of want to compare what the Rams did in 2017 to what they're doing now to what the Chiefs did in 2021 after they lost the Super Bowl and see how we can kind of tie it all together. With Brian Allen, Nick, that's another guy. Is he worth moving on from considering his cap hit rises substantially in 2023 and 2024? Like that's a guy. Could you potentially replace him? There's a lot of talk about Creed Humphrey, who's going to be starting in the Super Bowl for the Chiefs. Do you look to find the next starting center in, in potentially in the senior bowl? Well, I I mean, I think that's a good idea. It's interesting how the Rams run their organization where it does feel like at any moment. It's you are replaceable and you can be replaced like the Patriot way, you know, like Mm -hmm. next man up. I do not care who you are. Chad Ochozinko doesn't matter. You're in the system. Um, (laughs) But then also they kind of, you know, have their favorites and they have their ones that they're going to keep no matter what, um, even if potentially you could get something more from them. And I don't see Allen as one of those people that is going to hang around just for like, you know, the camaraderie or the like, like Hecker, the Super Bowl year last year, definitely, definitely felt like somebody that probably stayed a little too long. Um, And then, you know, he stayed and he got his ring, but there's zero complacency here. And I think with the cap hip, he's probably going to be gone. That would be my, my thought. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's a. He was a one point five million dollar cap at the year prior. It's all the way up to eight million in this next year, and then I think it rises to ten in the following year. So it's definitely something to. Obviously, the cap is rising this year, but you can't can't take everybody into consideration when it comes to building the roster and and moving the pieces in the right direction, right? If you if you're overly concerned about Brian Allen, uh, I think that you're gonna you're gonna get yourself in trouble. You have to be able to build depth because the best availability is ability. Best ability is availability, right? And durability in Brian Allen's career has been a little bit shaky. I know Sean McVay, for the most part, will talk very highly of him. He's the guy that you don't want to play against, as McVay always talks about. But you have to be able to be healthy in those scenarios. So potentially something to look to move on from. Right? And you could potentially find that in the draft. You could find it in free agency, and we'll get to that. Havenstein is a guy, Nick, that I don't – he's not due for another restructure – uh, they restructured his deal to save, I think it was $3.1 million of cap space back in 2021. I don't think there's any changes necessary there. It's maybe similar to the Joe Nopum situation, where if you actually give him some actual support to his right or to his left, you know, there and there's not a revolving door, you know, that's somebody that could potentially get back up to speed and and be where he was in the in the 2018 Super Bowl and the 2021 Super Bowl. So no issues with him whatsoever. Yeah, I think he's I think he is one of those people that needs to stay around i think yeah. losing him would be, and but I, I i don't see any need to having restructured it seems like you know they're all kind of on the same pace it's not like you're expecting anything different out of him and then yeah you know just like how you said take out the revolving door give this man some help on his left and his right and you're going to be in a completely different situation as we're right seeing. yeah rob havenstein has help on his left joe nopum has help on his right and both have shown that they're 
you know, middle of the pack to above average caliber left and right tackles in this league. So, I mean, Joe Newpin was one of the guys, Nick, in the offseason we were talking about how he could be one of the stars of this team. He could be one of the faces of the franchise. And unfortunately, due to the injury, it, it fell short of, of that expectation. So hopeful to see those two huge pieces come back into play. But again, we have a backup plan. We talked about Rob Havenstein. David Edwards, is he a priority to, to, to re-sign? Like in my opinion, if I'm reevaluating all of the, the unrestricted free agents, he's one of the top three. Like I think he fits within that example of what I'm going to potentially get as, in terms of a draft pick who could rise to the caliber of a starter on a Super Bowl winning team. Like that's exactly what you want to be able to draft. And having that for four years consistently climbing up, being able to then move into a starting role, I think is exactly what you want to see from a player of that caliber. And I think the concussion things, the back-to-back -back concussions in three weeks was a little bit scary, right? So if if, if he could have a, a nice, long, healthy offseason, that could be a piece that you keep in place. So for example, so, say we we kept Noteboom, we kept Havenstein, we kept Edwards, and then maybe you have to look to replace Brian, Ed, Brian Allen and then Coleman Shelton, like, is he going to be another guy that sticks around? I would like to keep him as depth, but not technically as a starter. And then in terms of the backups, like they got plenty of, of, of playing time, unfortunately, in terms of the backups this season. Chandler Brewer had 227 snaps. Alaric Jackson, which is a guy, Nick, if Joe Noteboom can't play and they feel like Alaric is a guy who can leapfrog Noteboom in terms of a starting left tackle, maybe you potentially find another spot for Noteboom on the line, right? So Maybe you move him inside to guard. Alaric Jackson, we talked about. Um, Jeremiah Cologne, the cop. Is he going to be coming back? No, but he probably played over 150 snaps. I think he played 100 and, 188 snaps. I remember I went to – I was at a uh, a sports bar watching the game, and I was like, you know, that guy was like a cop. And the, the my Rams fan next to me was just like, no, he's, no. And I pulled up the article and showed him. <laughs> how this man was literally a cop, like, up until last week at that point. I mean, it's just, like, that's where we were pulling from. From yeah. the LAPD were our <laughs> offensive linemen. It's insane. Well, it's because the guys like Logan Bruss were hurt were within the second snap of the preseason. Extremely unfortunate. There's another guy who you could potentially pencil in as a hopeful starter. A.J. Curie was one of the, I think, the Rams' last draft pick in 2021 or 2022. Um, and him being the last draft pick, that's a guy who got some considerable time. I think between one of those two guys, one of them needs to emerge because there's some parallels between what the Chiefs did in 2021 to rebuild that offensive line to get them back to Super Bowl caliber versus what the Rams are doing right now. And all the while, if you could figure out a way to somehow find the next Jordan Mailata, let alone potentially record a Rams Christmas album in coming years, uh, you know, I think you'd be in a good spot. But that's a guy who took two, three years in full to completely develop into the player that he is after playing rugby for his entire life. But that's a seventh round pick. So you're hopeful that you could potentially find somebody in the draft late that you could groom into a potential starter. I mean, unless, you, you know, you're willing to spend some major draft capital for a potential left tackle. So uh, I talked about parallels with the Chiefs. I know I'm teasing this majorly. But Orlando Brown is the left tackle for the Chiefs right now. He's an unrestricted free agent. Roger Saffold is going to be 35. I would love to see him come back to the Rams oh as a potential left guard. Right? It would be fun to see. Isaac Sayamalo is, the, I think, the starting right guard for the Eagles. In the Super Bowl, he's going to be an unrestricted free agent. There's no way they're going to be able to re-sign him. There's too many other players of priority. And you just need an offensive line coach that's going to be able to really kind of bring this all together. I was reading an article from Jordan. I think it was Zach Roseblatt. Um, the, in combination, the two of them were kind of going back and forth within the article. And Roseblatt mentioned uh, Nate Herbick, who is a 25-year-old. Uh, it was a solid player as a, as a fill-in, as a starter last year for the Jets. And especially as a run blocker for the Jets, he scored very highly. Familiar with LaFleur's system. You could get him at a fair price. And he only allowed one sack in over 700 snaps last year. I mean, guys like Ty Naseki, Matt Skora, Ode Aboshi, like those guys could all unfortunately take a walk, right? It was like a one-year contract. They came in, they were fillers. And then there's some other guys that I like in the draft as well. But I, for, from that perspective, there's four guys in terms of unrestricted free agents that I would try to prioritize. Some of them older, some of them younger. I think Orlando Brown's 28, Saffold 35, Sam is probably mid-20s, Herbig 25, right? So... 
if you go after some of the younger guys, you could rebuild this offensive line almost over, overnight. Yeah, I just worry that they don't like to bring in um, – like they don't like really honor the offensive line. I don't have faith in them bringing in uh, like a Saffold back or uh, mm. Samalu essentially just because they're probably going to be high-ticket people. And they are always thinking about like speed and offensive power and like you know big defensive players. So I wouldn't hold your breath for signing anybody that's an um, um, unrestricted free agent that's like top of the class in uh, offensive line. I think it's going to come down to more of the coach that they decide to bring in. Yeah, but um, Nick, let me uh, let me take you back to 2017 real quick. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna paint a little bit of a picture. McVay's first John- year, so great yeah. assault. Do you, do you remember John Sullivan, Sully, mm-hmm. starting starting center? They brought him in in 2017. Remember Andrew Whitworth? Yeah. 2017. Yeah. I Came know. In and, re- and resurrected us all. And Saffold and Rob Havenstein and Jamon Brown were already there. So they were really kind of the two missing pieces to rebuilding that offensive line for Jared Goff and Todd Gurley. Mm-hmm. So they've done it before is what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to go against the fact that you're saying that it it could potentially not happen. But they've been able to rebuild things very quickly with veteran players in the past. So I have faith that they could do that. And it's it's so detrimental to this point that you feel like the offense can't really come into its own until this offensive line is somewhat rebuilt. So are you ready for my Chiefs analogy? Yeah. Because I, I think am. you're I think you're really gonna like this. And I think that this is the template that you should be copying if you're less need. If you're Sean McVay, if you're the next potential offensive line coach for the Rams. So the Chiefs offensive line, Nick, complete overhaul after losing to Tom Brady and the Bucs in the Super Bowl. 2021 Super Bowl, I mean, it was just an annihilation. I think Patrick Mahomes was pressured on 29 of 56 of his dropbacks, which is the most of any quarterback in the Super Bowl era. Kansas City, they were completely decimated by injury by the time the Super Bowl was over. Mitchell Schwartz and Eric Fisher knocked out during the season. Kalichi uh, Osameli was also lost to an injury during the season. So there's three starters right there. Sound familiar? Yes, Mm. I'm sure it does. The end result was guard Andrew Wiley playing right tackle, where he's going to be starting in the upcoming Super Bowl. Mike Remmers was playing left tackle, which turned out to be an absolute disaster against Shaq Barrett. Um, and then after after the Super Bowl loss, the Chiefs, too, were projected. I think it was almost $24 million over the cap, and it looked like an almost impossible situation to overcome. But what did they do? They traded their 2021 first-round pick which was 31st overall, their third round pick, 94th overall, and their fourth round pick, 136 overall, along with uh, a 2022 fifth for Orlando Brown. So just a massive, massive overhaul. They ended up getting a a second round pick back and a sixth round pick back in in 2022. But that protected Mahomes' blindside for the next three seasons. And they've won 13 games every season since he came in. And that seems like a no-brainer deal, right? Yeah. I mean, it's Mahomes though. And like true. true. It's completely different. I've seen him just make magic. And I know it, you know, the biggest pass rush pass rush. Sorry. I I'm I'm used to rush. All, the, all the commentators saying pass rush. Um, <laughs> you know, it's completely different when you have Stafford. And I know he can, you know, run around back there, but it's kind of similar to when when we had Jarrett, where it was like you can only do so much with these guys. They need a clean pocket. Understandable. Uh, and Mahomes is not that guy. Mahomes can make magic out of nothing. So fantastic. I love the comparison, and, but they also got smoked in that Super Bowl. They got the smoked one, in the Super Bowl, like, but it, it, it was an awakening. And that's what I feel like the Rams are going through right now. Like they didn't just trade for Orlando Brown. They went into the draft. They drafted two offensive linemen. So they went Creed Humphrey, who we all know and love with the, um, what pick it was somewhere in the second round, potentially in the third round, a hundred and uh, 1200 snaps over 1200 snaps at Oklahoma. He didn't allow a single stack sack. That should have been a no brainer pick for the Rams. Instead, they went two two out. Well, and it, they went with Trey Smith in the fifth round from Oklahoma. He only allowed one sack in college. And uh, he's also, by the way, starting in next weekend, Super Bowl. So they signed Joe Thune to a five-year deal, 800 or 80 million. He started, he's starting in the Super Bowl coming up. Wiley, the right tackle, who we were talking about a little bit earlier, who ended up starting in the 2021 Super Bowl, ended up getting the practice that he needs. 
He's now a professional starting right tackle. He was originally an undrafted free agent. So they rebuilt that completely from the ground up. I know that Austin Blythe was there for a period of time. I think they brought him in as a stopgap guy. Chris Long's brother, Kyle Long, was there playing right tackle for some period of time while um, Wiley was developing. So I just think in terms of a, of a total overhaul, there's a lot of potential to be able to maneuver. And if if I have confidence in anybody to be able to do that based on what happened in 2017 and based on mm, maybe they haven't prioritized it the way that they should in off years. So like 19 was bad. 20 was okay. 20 was good. Right. And then 20, 2022, hopefully we, we get back on track. So it seems like there's that rude awakening, that one year that just kind of, you know, gets them back into the swing of things. Yeah. I think a, like a lot is going to happen well with them next year. I just don't foresee them just kind of, you know, crumbling again. A lot of it's going to come down to how fast LaFleur is going to have the offense going. If he's, you know, hopefully if they don't retool the entire thing, then, you know, we see something where Stafford's getting the ball out faster because a lot of what McVay likes to do is these long developing pass plays. So it never made sense to me why with a quarterback like Jarrett, they wouldn't try to grab, you know, elite offensive line talent because you have to let this play develop. So I'm fine with the complete retooling. Um, I don't know how much we would get on the market if we wanted to, you know, trade these guys that are under contract, but it would be interesting. I also kind of foresaw, and I, he's probably just having too much fun. I thought Whitworth was going to kind of pop his head in and like, you know, become like an offensive mind or line mind guru essentially. But he's, you know, he's announcing and he looks great up there doing it. And he's, Yeah, he does. But he's I mean, if, favorite. I, I, maybe you potentially match the salary. Say, hey, big wit for 1.2 million, you can come be a coaching fellow and an offensive line assistant for the Rams. And oh, by the way, you could also help redevelop Joe Nopum, who needs the most help possible redeveloping and becoming a starting caliber left tackle again. And that's if you don't make a move for him. Maybe he's a trade candidate, Nick, like you mentioned. Maybe that's somebody you try to move on from and you eat some dead cap. So I know that the offensive line conversation isn't something that's overly exciting. I just want to be able to give Rams fans optimism in terms of there are so many elite players that are unrestricted free agents that you could bring in to re-solidify this offensive line, plus the help of a NFL-ready, experienced offensive line coordinator is going to propel them to the next level. Plus, we talked about Mike LaFleur and and what he's able to do. Is Sean McVay going to give up his play-calling duties? Probably not. They said no from the report I read. Yeah, but I mean, then we always go back to that play in the Super Bowl where Kevin O'Connell was essentially dialing up plays and Sean was tapping him on the chest saying, we love that one, Kevin. We love that. So, you know, maybe we get a little bit of that. I, maybe not technically calling the plays, but adding insight and um, making sure that McVay's staying on his toes and not getting complacent. Yeah. I would love to see him relinquish duty. And I, I think we saw last year in preseason, we, they, uh, they let Liam take over, and it was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so well, then we don't want to see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do remember that. But, I mean, ball. that was Luke. I have, like, it, Mike had to have been calling plays on the Jets. Like, there's, oh, yeah. there's zero way he, he, he wasn't. So, oh, he definitely, he definitely was. Yeah. So, I mean – Coming to LA, it's almost like a devotion. It's kind of becoming like like you were like a solo screenwriter, and then you get on a job, and and they partner you up with somebody, and you kind of take like a secondary credit when like coming out here. So yeah, you know, I mean, he did get fired, so maybe he thought he saw it as like a good thing. Mutual parting of ways. Yeah, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, so I th- I think the impact of Zach Wilson, and then the difference between what they had with Mike White. Was, was really interesting. And I think even when the Jets were winning this past season, when the pass game was not a threat because it was never a threat with Joe Flacco or Zach Wilson, if anything, it was more of a threat when Mike Wilson was installed into the offense. And I, they leaned into their rushing attack, and it was Brees Hall. It's rookie running back Brees Hall, which is another reason why I think the Rams could potentially draft a running back and not overly excited about it unless it's a kid like Brees Hall who could potentially open up the offense. And like he looked fantastic before tearing his ACL. And then 
down went the Jets, down went the offensive line, the rushing attack went down with it. And then over the last eight weeks of the season, the Jets only averaged 3.57 yards per carry, which is the second fewest in the NFL. But it's like anything else. It's it's so nuanced. I think that what the Rams saw was a sample size of really good stuff with Mike LaFleur. And they felt like within an eight, seven, eight game sample size, if you could work with this kind of personnel on offense, just wait until what Sean McVay and Matthew Stafford and Cooper Cup have have ready for you when you come to Los Angeles. So there should be some real excitement. I think they're really going to be able to install uh, a next level run scheme that complements the pass game. You can marry those two components together. Your offense is right back into the position where it was in 17 and 18 and 21. Although the run game still lacked when they won the Super Bowl, which I can't, still can't believe. Mm. It seems like the league goes in different positions and directions every single year. One year, it's the high-flying passing attack. The next year, it's the best offensive line in football and a dynamic rushing attack that wins. Or maybe it's Mahomes this year. But to me, when I see the Eagles, I just think dynamic rushing team that can attack the outside. So, hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm just really excited to see what the, like the offense is going to be. It felt like last year we didn't really get a sample size of any really good games offensively. If anything, we were watching the one Baker Mayfield game, which was like one drive. Mm-hmm. So, And I don't know how many Jets games you watched, but every single one when Zach Wilson came back, like after the injury, I mean, he couldn't do anything. I remember there was a Jags. Jets game Thursday night and the, and the Jags were on like a heater and everybody was like, I think the Jets are better. And Zach Wilson, I think had like five completions. It was something like mm-hmm. historically low. I, he's terrible. Like I mean, if I were Mike LaFleur, I'd be mutually parting ways to Los Angeles in the same way. In that first year in that rookie season that Zach Wilson had, there are a ton of reports that are out there, specifically from Jordan and Zach that I was talking to the article that I alluded to, that the offense was far too complex for him to grasp in that first season. Like it was far and beyond above what he could comprehend. And then the next season, they drastically, drastically scaled it back so that they could potentially complement some of the skill sets that he does have. Having him in the RPO, some of the split zone running games, you know, keeping him mobile, keeping things in structure, but a little bit out of structure. Um, I, I, what Mike LaFleur, I think, is going to be able to do for this offense is bring it back together. He's going to help to bring it back together. And I think with an offensive line, a real offensive line coach, and Sean McVay back in his business, the offense is going to be kicking again next year. Yeah. I'm hopeful. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll I see. feel good. I feel good. And I'm looking forward to watching um, some more Rams players and – my favorite Ram himself, Ram Page, uh, at the Pro Bowl. <laughs> yeah, Sunday, I guess, is the actual flag football event. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I want to, I'm going to tune in tonight. I don't know why it's split between Thursday and Sunday. Why don't you go, like, midday Saturday into 3 o'clock Sunday? I don't know. I guess they're trying to break, like, you know, break it up so all well, of and the football content doesn't just abruptly end. And if it's right, and if it's about the players too, if you get your stuff in tonight, that means tomorrow night is a full party. Friday yeah. night in Vegas, got nothing to worry about for Saturday. No cramps, no hangovers, no nothing. The one thing I saw was um, Derek Carr. They're like, "Well, you're zipping the ball pretty good here," and he was like, "Yeah, you know, I I, I guess I didn't do it good enough to like hang around or something like that." Tough I mean, life I think, for the cars. I think he's great. I think he, if if he gets put on a team, best best scenario for Derek Carr. What do you think it is? Dallas. Well, yeah, but that's not going to happen. For uh, yeah, I'm turn, I'm thinking about a team that needs a quarterback. Uh, maybe he goes back to Houston. Maybe he goes back and follows in his older brother's footsteps. Who's was the first quarterback that team had ever drafted as an expansion team. David Carr never got a, a fair shot there. Now they're reuniting with uh, D'Amico Rines, and it seems like there's some there's some love in Houston, is what it seems like. And yeah. the fans are excited to have D'Amico Rines back. I think that Derek Carr could go there. Yeah, for sure. I and maybe, don't but think is that, that all, happening at all? Yeah, is that a waste if you draft a top quarterback, though? That's my other fear. 
Yeah, I I would draft a top quarterback and not worry about you know th- that franchise has so much that they have to uh, fix and like let's start somewhere and get like a young guy that we can trust and maybe build around and you know get that um, rookie contract and like really make a push. Yeah, yeah, maybe Derek Carr is just a tad bit expensive, but if you're Houston and if you know the Raiders, I was reading rumors that they could potentially offer a fifth round pick to trade for Derek Carr. Like that's nothing. Yeah. I'm, I, if I'm Houston, I'm giving you a fifth round pick. I'm bringing Derek Carr in right now. And then maybe you trade down in the draft to get more capital. Yeah. You know, and you wait yeah. till the next round of, of top quarterback candidates. I just don't think they want to, you know, reset the whole process. I think he's going to go to the commanders. I mean, that just makes the most sense. For yeah. Me. Yeah. And, so and anchor, it, you know, don't, yeah. Anchor. Don't worry. We know that Ron Rivera didn't get fired. That's a, <laughs> it's a Twitter inside joke. We, we know he's done. We, he's done with us. We know now. No, yeah. Don't be done with us. Anchor. Come, please come back. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Ron's not, Ron's not going anywhere for right now. If he gets off to a slow start, but like you said, with a veteran quarterback, that team is capable of, of making he should a have been fired. I don't know how Ron Rivera wasn't fired. I was kind of thinking the same thing. and missed the playoffs for the third straight year. Right. No, they made it. They made it in 2020. Uh, see, th- this is proof that I know nothing about the Commanders. So I'm just gonna <laughs> gonna stop talking about the Commanders because they stink. Yeah, remember that Heineke game against Brady where they almost won? The last Heineke game I watched, it was a roughing the passer call against the Eagles. It was one of the Eagles' only losses of the season. Oh, he just like flexing. He got hit in the back, was pumping his fists. So I'm like, yeah. I'm not watching this kid anymore. I can't stand him. Well, yeah, I mean, the game I'm talking about was like from two years ago. So I know. My apologies, Commanders fans and anchors specifically. Um, players who I, we think could potentially follow Mike LaFleur to Los Angeles. This is something that Rosenblatt had in his article with Jordan as well. I don't think this is anything that's crazy. I think this is kind of common knowledge based on who are unrestricted free agents for the Jets. But Mike White has some potential linkage to follow Michael LaFleur to Los Angeles and be Matthew Stafford's backup. You know me, Mike Mike White's biggest fan would be very happy about that. Yeah, I wouldn't hate that. If, As a, if, if we need don't backup. get Baker. Yeah, yeah if, you can't, if you can't keep Baker. I, I think Baker would be my priority over Mike White, but um, that's a player that could potentially follow him. We talked about running backs, Nick. Maybe instead of drafting a running back, they go after Ty Johnson. He's a solid pass-catching running back. Could complement Cam and Kyron. Um, maybe he even replaces Kyron. Who even knows what Kyron's going to be at this point? Um, but Mike LaFleur had used him, as, as Roseblad noted, more often than Jets fans would have liked. So maybe, maybe it's a guy that they're trying to get out of the city. Corey Davis, I remember many coined him as the next T.O. when he was coming out of the draft, just in terms of how big and strong that he was. He could potentially be a cap casualty. And then the other guy is Braxton Berrios, which I feel like the Rams already have that in Brandon Powell or Tutu Atwell. So I don't see any situation where Barrios comes to Los Angeles, but no, they were just four see, names that I thought were interesting. I want to see what's it called? Just more Powell and the fact that you know they use somebody like him in the Jets offense like effectively. Yep. Uh, I I really hope Powell kind of gets a chance to shine. Um, I mean, hopefully Allen Robinson comes back next year and it's a different player than than what we saw. Because he was like, you know, essentially garbage. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he didn't play full season, so I, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But still, I think Corey yeah. Davis would be kind of awesome. You know? Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I, I that do. That makes a lot of sense to me. What Matthew Stafford really likes in his receivers is size. And when you watch somebody like T. Higgins for the Bengals play in the AFC Championship, watch him go up and get balls over players. You know, Jamar Chase goes up and gets Basidi Lamb. Just watching late in the playoffs, these big, tall receivers go up and get the ball. I mean, that's what you're hopeful in for Allen Robinson. That's what you wanted in Odell Beckham Jr. But, um, yeah, no, I, I like the idea of a, of a very, very cheap one-year deal for a player who's looking to prove himself, and that could potentially be Corey Davis. Braxton Berrios is Danny Amendola. Right. We don't need anything like that here. So, although I love the Paisan. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. We love the Paisan. Yeah, we love every Paisan. Sirianni. Mamma mia. Yeah, Sirianni. All right. That's all we got. Thank you guys for listening. I hope that um, 
you've enjoyed our content and you've taken the time to like and subscribe. It's very, very meaningful to us. And if you leave us a review on Apple Pods or YouTube or wherever that may be, we're very, very appreciative of the fact that you've taken the time to, to spend it with us. So yeah. we love you. And I got some fun. Uh, my buddy who went to the Super Bowl last year is giving giving me like a bunch of the LA Rams black Super Bowl hats, like the hats oh, that they nice. wore when they won. So I'll be doing some giveaways during the offseason. Sweet. Yeah. Love that. How do oh, I yeah. enter? Huh? I said, how do I enter? Do you not have one? I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, I think I may. Uh, not yeah. a black one. Oh, I was the, gonna say, the, I, the one with the trophy on it? No, no. It's like the actual one that, that they gave to the players. Oh, yeah. I want one. Yeah, I'll give you one. Okay. All right. Love so it. I have 10. I have 10 to give away. Okay. All right. Stay tuned. You can win a free it. hat just by listening to Rams Brothers. Yeah. Hell yeah, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Thank you guys for listening. Appreciate night. you. Go Rams.